<laughs> Hi everyone and welcome to our webinar on broadband connectivity and affordable housing. My name is Rebecca King and I'm a policy associate with the National Housing Conference. For those of you who aren't familiar with NHC, we're a national organization that provides advocacy, resources, and research around affordable housing issues at the federal, state, and local level. Just a couple points on technical details. We will provide the presentation, both the recording and the slides, after the fact to everyone who registered. And if you have questions as we're going through the webinar, please don't hesitate. Just go ahead and send them along through the question box. We will take questions at the end, but you can send them throughout the whole webinar. And if you have any technology issues, you can use the help menu or visit support.citrixonline.com. Excuse me. I also want to take a quick second to thank Capital One for sponsoring today's webinar and our other NAC webinar series. Any opinions or errors, however, are ours alone. Give me just one second. We have some Capital One folks who would like to give a few remarks. Heather, you should be. Hi, can you hear me? Hello? Oh, no. Um, then I'll make it quick, and I just want to thank everyone for joining. This is an issue that is um, critically important to us, um, and certainly we look forward not only to the webinar, but to everybody's feedback on the work that they're doing in this space. So thanks again for your time today, and thank you for the work and putting it together. Thank you, Heather. Again, we are having a little delay. There we go. Um, I've already introduced myself, but our presentation today will be given by my colleague, Mindy Alt, who's a research associate also with NHC, and Catherine Crago, who is the head of strategic initiatives and resource development for Austin Pathways in Austin, Texas. Mindy is a research associate here at NHC Center for Housing Policy. Her research areas include homelessness and housing first policies, housing intersections, and economic and demographic factors related to housing affordability. Prior to joining an HC in October of 2014, Mindy worked with The Road Home, a homeless services provider in Salt Lake City, Utah, doing direct practice social work with a chronically homeless population. She also holds a Master of Public Policy degree from American University and a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Cincinnati. Catherine Crago is, as I mentioned, head of strategic initiatives and resource development. She started her career in the semiconductor industry. For more than 10 years, she has helped state agencies and local governments assess the business case for digital inclusion to enhance revenue, support emergency preparedness, and to promote equity in diverse communities. She has consulted with consortia about how digital tools and practices can level the playing field and with corporations about how to use digital tools to manage distributed engineering teams in diverse locations. She has worked with Anderson Consulting in strategic cost management and serves on the board of advisors and lectures in the University of Texas system in the human dimensions of organizations. She's a recipient of the Texas Diversity Council Diversity First Award for her work in diversity and inclusion. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in History from the University of Texas at Austin and has lived and worked in Belgium, the Netherlands, Korea, and Taiwan. And we're so glad that she is here to present with us today. Part of the impetus for this webinar is NHC's work around broadband through our connectivity working group. We convene with several practitioners in the affordable housing field. We've provided some research on the digital divide, some policy recommendations, and case studies showcasing how two affordable housing providers are offering high-speed broadband to low-income residents. The demographics of the residents and the resources were different between the two organizations, but they do provide two examples of how you can implement broadband in affordable housing. And with that, I'm going to hand the presentation over to Mindy, who's going to go into detail on those studies, and then Catherine will speak an update on Austin's program for us. 
Hi everyone. Um, as uh, as Rebecca said, my name is Mindy Alt. I'm a researcher here at NHC. Um, I had the privilege of writing these case studies as part of our work on broadband connectivity and affordable housing, and I'd like to share what we learned. I'm having a little technical snag here. I think that's where we want to be. Yeah. Um, our first case study focuses on Eden Housing, specifically their Cottonwood Place development in Fremont, California. Cottonwood Place was opened in 2012 and comprises a mixed-use development that combines housing and health care for low-income seniors aged 62 and older. There are 98 housing units, 10 of which are set aside for frail or higher needs seniors. The project is a partnership between Eden Housing and Onlock Lifeways, which is a senior health services organization. Onlock provides a clinic and day center on site at Cottonwood and offers a program of all-inclusive care for the elderly. Um, the acronym for that is a PACE program. I was not familiar with that prior to this, um, but maybe some of you are. Um, a PACE program serves all the serves all seniors with dual enrollment in Medicaid and Medicare, um, and it provides comprehensive and medical social services to residents with the, with the chief goal of helping them to remain living independently instead of having to go into a nursing home. In the Cottonwood Place development, Eden Housing offers wired broadband access free of charge plus a free modem in each unit. We did some, I did some research ahead of time on the benefits of internet access for seniors. Um, and more and more is being done in this area and we're, we're getting more familiar with what the benefits there are to be, to be gained for our senior population. Um, in discussions of internet access and broadband connectivity, we often think younger adults or families with school-aged children, but research shows that there really are benefits for internet access for seniors. Internet-based features like email and social media have been shown to help seniors avoid social isolation, which is a leading contributor to poor outcomes for seniors in both mental and physical health. A high-speed broadband connection in particular allows for video chats, which can be especially enriching for seniors compared to telephone conversations or email exchanges with loved ones. Internet con connectivity can also improve healthcare delivery for seniors. Video, con video conferencing with medical professionals has been shown to improve communication between older patients and providers. A recent study by the Veterans Administration showed that patients receiving mental health care had substantially reduced hospitalizations when given access to high-speed video conferencing for therapy sessions. Um, it's thought that that can be useful in the same way for senior citizens. Another study conducted by the Phoenix Center for Advanced Legal and Economic Public Policy Studies showed that internet use among seniors was associated with a 20% reduction in depression severity. And finally, researchers at UCLA found that spending time on the internet improved cognitive functioning in middle-aged and older adults with little internet experience by stimulating areas of the brain that control decision-making and complex reasoning. The Pew Research Center recently found that the number of older Americans using the internet is growing, but usage rates decline with income. The study found that of seniors with an annual household income under, under $30,000, only 39% report going online compared to 90% of seniors with incomes over $75,000. This difference is even more when comparing rates of seniors with broadband connectivity in their homes. 5% of seniors with annual incomes under 30,000 have in-home broadband access, compared to 82% of those with annual incomes over $75,000. So the cost for in-unit access property-wide for Cottonwood Place is $190 per month. It's important to note that this is this is not um, high-speed access, or it is, I'm sorry, it is high-speed access, but it is wired, and it's just through one main hookup um, in the uh, in the building. The charge is included as a line item in the property's general operating budget. Initially, Eden Housing offered free in-unit broadband access because California's Qualified Allocation Plan application for low-income housing tax credits awarded additional points to applicants who offer this. But they, uh, they also pointed out, though, they probably would have way because they, uh, Eden Housing is a big believer in, in digital inclusion. But, they, but initially, it was brought up because of the, the QAP's encouragement. Um, development was initially funded through the, eight, through the HUD 202 Supportive Housing for the Elderly Program and Low Income Housing Tax Credits. And it's primarily supported on an ongoing basis by rental income from the residents themselves. 
Cottonwood Place provides an on-site computer lab with computers available for use by everyone. In order to access the internet in their units, residents must provide their own computers or tablets. Um, Eden Housing, through its Communities Wired initiative, offers low-cost options for devices starting at $75 for a tablet and $120 for a laptop for residents to purchase their own online device. The Communities Wired initiative also offers digital literacy classes for Eden Housing residents. Um, and this, this too, we have recent research confirming that digital literacy courses are very effective for improving computer confidence and computer self-efficacy in lower-income seniors. Usage records show um, that about 95% of Cottonwood Place residential units have connected a computer, tablet, or smartphone to the internet using the free modems provided. This could be residents making use of the internet or visitors using their own devices to go online. It's not, it's not, there's not a way currently of telling what kind of device or whom is that, who is accessing it. Um, <laughs> Jennifer Reed, who's Director of Fund Development and Public Relations for Eden Housing has estimated that about 70 to 80 percent of place <laughs> residents uh, have a computer or tablet of their own and that many residents use the internet to access television channels broadcast in their native countries. Um, all right, so moving on to the program in Texas. Um, in 2013, Google Fiber announced plans to expand its infrastructure to Austin, Texas. Uh, as part of the expansion, Google Fiber awarded free high-speed broadband access to 100 community institutions, including the Housing Authority of the City of Austin, um, or HACA, for their Booker T. Washington multifamily properties. This would be in a compute community computer lab to include classroom space and a workforce development site. This eventually led to a partnership between Google Fiber and HACA to provide free in-home broadband access to residents at all 18 HACA properties. The collaboration with Google Fiber represented a crucial piece in HACA's Unlocking the Connection Project, a community-based initiative to help low-income families gain access to opportunities afforded by in-home internet access. So things like improved capacity for employment searches, electronic communication with healthcare providers and teachers using email and online forms, um, and access to open source educational materials. HACA's 501c3 nonprofit subsidiary called Austin Pathways was charged with seeking funding and implementing the Unlocking the Connection program. For this particular initiative, Google Fiber agreed to waive the $300 per unit connection fee for all HACA units and also to provide free basic internet access to residents at all HACA developments for 10 years. Austin Pathways also developed an Earn a Device program that provided refurbished de desktop computers for residents who complete a digital literacy training. The computers are provided for free through a partnership with Austin Community College and are loaded with free open access educational content. All right. Um, as of September 2015, the first phase of the Unlocking Connection initiative was expected to cost approximately $1.4 million, included, which is inclusive of the cost of in-kind services contributed by Google Fiber. Funding for the initiative was originally provided by the Ford Foundation and the Open Society Foundation, um, representing a collabor collaboration of public, private, and nonprofit partners to serve as a kind of public-private initiative that's worked very well for this model. There are also collaborations with several in-kind partners, including Austin Community College, or ACC. Um, they're providing refurbished computers for every household in the first six HACA properties. They'll also continue to, to provide retired computers for other HACA units as they come online. In addition, HACA and ACC are exploring ways, or they were at the time of the, that the case study was written, they were exploring ways in which ACC students could provide technical support and training to HACA residents in the future. IBM provided in-kind strategic planning services for the initiative. Freescale Semiconductor and Rackspace, which is a managed cloud computing company, contributed funds for a K-12 STEM education that will enable children in public housing to gain digital literacy skills. The University of Texas Moody College of Communication is evaluating the effectiveness of the Unlocking the Connection program through a formal evaluation. And Everyone On, which is a nonprofit agency that works with telecom companies to help people in low-income areas to have internet access at discounted prices, are providing technical assistance um, to Austin Pathways. They were also, Austin Pathways was also awarded grants from the City of Austin's Grant for Technology Opportunities Program and from the Central Texas Summer STEM Funding Collaborative 
to fund a STEM initiative for children ages 6 through 14 and a computer lab apprenticeship program to be offered at all, to all Hawker residents. In addition to educational, health, and social benefits, broadband internet access is expected to provide other peripheral benefits. These could include the eventual use of internet-connected thermostat controls that could facilitate regulation of interior temperatures, um, potentially leading to energy savings for residents and for HACA. Uh, preventive emergency medical service savings could result for unit, um, that, units that house seniors or people with disabilities if, they're, if they can be equipped with an internet-based device that could alert caregivers or case managers when a refrigerator or cabinet door has not been opened for a set period of time to indicate for instance, the resident hasn't been taking um, a medication that they've been prescribed. And finally, time savings can be achieved for social workers um, in the HACA, in the HACA's family self-sufficiency program um, with the use of a web-based smartphone app to check the status of a client's public assistance application or request income verification from Social Security. Um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Catherine to, um, to talk about What's been what's been going on with this program since we did the case study last year? Thank you, Mindy, and thank you, Rebecca, for stewarding this issue. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, good afternoon. Thank you also um, to the Connect Home cities that are dialed in. Um, Sylvia Blanco, our EVP, and I were really happy to to see that you guys are here. Uh, we're talking a lot about technology and you know we use the word connecting a lot and I think that the theme for our program to date has been really that human connection is the change agent for technology adoption. Um, when Mindy and Rebecca asked me to participate today they asked us to share uh, some of the lessons that we've learned um, and we've learned those with a whole host of partners in many cases with our residents who are engaged with us in ensuring that there's more equity in the economy. So I'm going to share our experience registering Google Fiber, uh, re registering residents for Google Fiber, and how our residents are using their new digital literacy skills in productive and often very unpredictable ways. And um, and and a little bit uh, too about how we're sustaining our efforts and learning together. So in November of 2014, we launched our initiative. Um, Secretary Castro came to Austin. This is our Booker T. Washington property to help us launch the connection. We announced on this day that we would be able to begin to meet our 2014 strategic plan objectives to bring internet access to every single housing authority resident. As many of you have heard, we have this partnership with Google Fiber, which has been wonderful, and they will provide free basic broadband to all Hawker residents for 10 years. So in the past year, we focused it on registering residents in five sites, which are in the southern part of our city. Um, our 18 sites span from the north to the south in an eastern arc that some folks in Austin call the Arc of Poverty. Next slide. So this is an image on that day, and, and this image really represents um, who we think of as being in our ecosystem of digital inclusion. So often programs are focused on the residents alone. Here at the table you see two Hakka children. More than 50% of our residents are children. Um, to the left you see one of our service providers from community and schools, uh, Secretary Castro from HUD, and just almost out of frame is our CEO, Mike Gerber. So really, we, when we think about digital inclusion today, we think about each member of this ecosystem and how we're integrating digital technologies into all of the services and programs that we provide. So again, um, almost you know, 1,800 public housing families to date since Mindy published, Mindy and, and NHC uh, published the case study on Austin, we have dealt primarily with 600 households. Of those 600 households, more than 80% have registered for free basic broadband. About 30% have completed 32 to 60 hours of digital literacy training. And about 28% of those folks have earned a refurbished device. So um, 
those three elements, I raise them because they're important. All three of those elements are part of our strategic plan. We know that um, internet alone is not enough. You need the, the digital literacy skills and a device to actually realize the dream of reaping the benefits of, of the digital economy. So it sounds easy, um, <laughs> right? Everybody wants free internet. Well, it's not that easy. We knew that about 15% of our residents are what we're now had an internet connection of some kind based on our Rosewood Choice Neighborhood study that we had done. And what we learned during our outreach efforts to help residents register for free internet in classes is that they fall on a continuum. We discovered that about 10 to 15 percent of the people who are already connected to the internet are people that we consider to be internet poor. These families pay 75 to $130 a month for high-speed internet. Even families that pay $40 per month are sometimes internet poor. So these are folks who understand the value of connectivity so much that they may pay the light bill one month and the internet bill the next. So for these families, registering for free internet was not hard. Uh, for these families, uh, in fact, some felt that basic broadband that we were providing was too slow at 5 megabytes per second down and 1 megabyte per second up. But for these families, we shared that having the internet in your unit, even if you choose to use your current provider at $130 per month, for the, is like 10 years of internet insurance. If you're ever unable to pay your internet bill one month, you can always rely on your free basic connection. For residents that haven't adopted the internet, and for these folks, internet access may constitute the greatest increase in their quality of life. The greatest barrier to adoption is just trust. These residents would ask us, is this really free? Am I going to get a charge next month? Will my caregiver get a charge? Yes, it's really free. We found that by meeting residents multiple times and leveraging our community development staff, that we could begin to get to the bottom of people's concerns, the concerns that non-adopters have. For example, someone might say, if I don't get a receipt from the bank, how will I prove I paid this bill? If I don't go to the doctor's office to set an appointment and I don't have that relationship with the nursing staff and this piece of paper in my hand, will I move back to the line when it's time for my appointment? These concerns are very real. Um, so, much of, so many of our residents, what they really have is social capital. They have relationship capital that's built up in face-to-face -face environments. So while many of our residents, they are still willing to take the bus to pay a utility bill so that they have that receipt and that their friend who works um, where they pay their utility bill says, yes, she was here last month. We don't want that to be the only option. So often we have to work to explain that if you use the internet to do some of these things, you can do them reliably. And when we're standing at someone's door with a community development staff and a representative of Google Fiber and someone from Austin Freenet, our training partner, we can assure the resident you're going to have the training that you need and the device right there in your home and the internet that you need to pay your bill online and to save the receipt on your computer. So this is an image of our 33 household property Manchac Village. We started here with the spirit of going slow and going small, starting small in order to, to learn the most that we could. And the person you see here is Maria. And she's like some of our residents that had initially safety concerns. Her whole family is online. She was not online. And her question was, can I really be safe online? Um, my family said that Haka can see what I'm doing on my computer if I use free internet. And so um, she was also one of the people who said, if I get free internet, then my grandson or my granddaughter may not come to visit to help me do things online that they help me do. So we um, now know that Maria, who is at Manchac Village and has had internet and a computer and digital literacy training, she, her fears that her family would not come are, are, were unfounded. Um, she says that it's difficult to keep her family away now that she has a really fast connection in her home.
So a key for us, too, in our second phase has been offering a continuum of digital literacy programs. Um, digital literacy, you hear, it's all about relevance. Why does somebody need it? What will it give me? And the outcome goals for different populations vary. Um, folks who are on the call from public housing authorities may use family self-sufficiency goals or Ross goals as outcomes. And we had to work to define how various parts of our population could be successful in our existing uh, way of measuring success with digital inclusion, with digital literacy. We also knew that um, people have really diverse experiences in the classroom and different experiences learning. And um, that we would have to work really hard to help people learn how to use the computers that we were deploying. Austin Community College so graciously provided us with um, computers for every household that we could refurbish. And initially, because of budget concerns, we refurbish those computers with free and open source software. They come with Linux and LibreOffice and 32 gigabytes of content, educational content that work works even when the machine is, is offline. So um, the keys to serving a, a, a continuum of our population for us have been implementing our earn a device program. When residents know that they can earn a device, some residents will take classes so they can earn a device for their children. Some children will participate in camps because they can earn a device for their parent. And so the family becomes engaged. The other key is that folks realize they are earning a device with the 32 to 60 hours of digital literacy training. Second, our first partner was Austin Freenet. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Austin Freenet customized learning for every resident. It's a modular approach. Um, residents come in. They say what their learning goals are. And then Freenet designs something that works for them in the classroom. They go as fast or as slow as they want to go. <coughs> Excuse me. The second key, could you go back, sorry, Mindy, just one slide. The, the, the two other things are just our digital ambassador program, which um, is, is a way that residents can be paid a stipend to help other residents. We have 12 of these folks now. Um, and there we provide them opportunities to innovate and design the program. And because we do that, because they are leading the design of the program in many ways, we have amazing, they have provided amazing innovations and services and products that fill the gaps in our program in very unpredictable ways. Okay. Next slide. So this is a picture of one of our classrooms. And I think this, this image really illustrates a lot of what we're doing. So from the very left here, you see that's Mac with the Cowboys hat on, or maybe it's the Houston Texans. Um, excuse me. So that's Mac. And then standing above Mac, you see Ernesto Resto, who's one of our digital ambassadors. And he's supporting the instructor, Robin Medina, who's there in the black and white shirt. She's our Austin Freenet instructor. In the back, you see um, probably a millennial on a cell phone, which you may not find the slightest bit unusual. But that's actually the child of one of the folks who's learning. And we find often that when people bring their children, they do stand around. And they do discover that they don't know everything about computers. And they become engaged, too. And then you have here uh, one of our, our students, who's a learner. And then to the right, you have Uni who is one of our corporate volunteers. And this slide is, is meaningful to me, this image, um, because all of these people play a part in the ecosystem that, that we've developed. And I'll just focus on one who's really, who seems to be in the background here. That's Ernesto. Because his story, it illustrates a lot about what we've learned about digital literacy component of unlocking the connection. When residents are engaged in, in training, they're not only peers, but they become peer leaders. In fact, Ernesto later ran for resident council president and was elected. And part of his platform was that he could help people learn to use their computers. 
they, they also innovate in ways that we just can't predict. Um, Ernesto's trajectory, it's like many of, of our residents. He attended uh, the first special resident meeting at Henry Flores Center. And then he and his wife res registered for the second Techstarter digital literacy class. He said that he had experience with computers, a lot of experience. Um, he had done some assembly in the past and registered for the class and began to learn that he didn't have quite all the skills that he thought he did. <laughs> Excuse me. So then our, our pilot program partner, Austin Freenet, they have this unique way of teaching the class. During the, the 60 hours of classroom training, some of the core lessons are taught to all and some are or customized and modular. And so Ernesto chose a course of learning that was apart from the online email program and how to use Google Docs and cloud-based tools. He wanted to learn how to help residents do special things like access social security records online, like um, learn how to use the uh, school district portal, learn, help parents learn how to do that. So while Ernesto's wife was learning the simple office programs, he began helping other residents. And on the day that residents received the computers, um, we were deploying the computers, and Ernesto was, was moving to a couple of the folks who speak Spanish and Arabic and um, providing and helping them download um, Spanish language and Arabic language uh, operating systems to their machines. Um, Ernesto is the first person who told us, you did a really good job. <clears throat> choosing the Linux operating system. Pardon me. Because um, it, it would not play bootleg DVDs or illegally downloaded movies. And, and we did choose Linux because we thought it would help to deter viruses with our, with our newbies. But many of our residents were not aware of the copyright laws or DVDs, and um, they were disappointed when their new computers could not play those. So then a couple of months ago, we noticed that Ernesto, who was helping us with the deployments, was providing residents with USB sticks. And we didn't know what, what those were, why he was giving them those. And it turned out that he had begun to fill another gap uh, that we didn't know existed and we couldn't even imagine existed. The trip hazard provision in our leases means that residents can't run cable along the ground. And in some apartments, they can't staple or nail cable to the wall. So Ernesto had begun fashioning USB Wi-Fi sticks so that residents could put their computer wherever they want to in their apartments and still get an internet signal. He, um, we encouraged him to start a business selling the USB sticks. And he began to do that. Of course, some families just make dinner for his family. But his experience showed us that when we put beginners and intermediate and advanced learners in a class, we develop peer mentors, we develop near peer mentors, and we develop a community of, that is a co-learning community. And that's become really important um, to, our, to our cause. And you know, because the residents are neighbors, um, they help each other in various ways. Um, one of the residents that I spoke with after a class um, a few months ago, Natividad Castillo, she helped me understand that. She was in a traffic accident a few years ago, and um, she told me that she took the class initially because it was her attempt to stop being so isolated. She had been in her apartment for a number of years after her tra traffic accident. And so her initial plan was to take the class so that she could put a computer in her apartment and stay connected to her family that way. So. When I asked her what she learned in the digital literacy class, she said, well, my brain injury prevents me from remembering a lot of what the instructor taught me. But what I learned in that class is there are a lot of strong women who are my neighbors. And they keep trying to learn the computer, even if they can't grasp it at first. And they will help me if I need help. And so she really insisted that what she gained from the class is community. And whenever I see her, she um, at various digital literacy events, she puts her fist up and says, adelante, which is, let's go forward, keep going. 
today we have 12 residents who are working as digital ambassadors and some that, like Nati that we try to recruit that we haven't yet. But um, we, we believe this is a really important um, aspect of our, of our program. Next slide. So finally, um, it, it really takes a, a village. As our executive vice president, Sylvia Blanco, always says, it takes a village. And we have been fortunate that our partners, our funders, have been willing to help us, um, even though we're starting, we started small. And we always have a kind of a spirit of learning. We're going to do a pilot first. And we're willing to share our successes and failures. Um, there's, a, there's a saying in the innovation field, which is fail to succeed. And so we had to take a look at our strengths and <clears throat> assets and leverage those as much as possible. Um, we also continue to try to share our successes and failures. And I hope that we'll be able to keep sharing those with all of you and, and learn from yours as well. Thank you. Thanks so much, Catherine. I really appreciate getting that level of detail about HACA's program. Um, so we can now take questions from the audience. So please send us any um, questions you have about the case studies and about HACA's program. Um, while we're waiting, I was, I was hoping, Catherine, maybe you could give us, um, if possible, just maybe two or three kind of top lessons learned that would be helpful for other PHAs or um, housing developers wanting to do this work, putting broadband in their units. Um, kind of a summary of some of your remarks, but things well, that you wish you had known at the beginning, maybe. Yeah, you know, I think I think my top, my top three, the first one would be human connection is the key to technology adoption. And um, you know, every property is different. Every family is different. So our adoption approach, it, you know, we had the opportunity to do a very high-tech approach. There are lots of smart people that know how to process direct mail and um, who know how to use technology to reach people. But we decided to go high-touch. And so today, if we have a stark choice between we can reach 100 people with a tech area, or we can reach one family at, at a time with a, a team comprised of our community development staff, our trainer, and Google Fiber. We would go the high touch approach. Because <clears throat> when residents, um, when we connect with residents on an individual basis and work through all of the trust um, and concerns and those kinds of things, we've cr created an educated, knowledgeable person who's found their own way into the conversation, and they will share that with their neighbors. Um, so it takes time, and it takes resources and patience, but human connection would be number one. And I think the second one would be the, the you know, the saying from the innovation field, fail to succeed. Um, if you start small, of course, you, it's expensive to fail. So you want to fail on a very small scale. But we, we agreed to start small. And with the 33-unit Manchac Village property, with sometimes we had 18 service providers there and 18 residents. But we, we shared with residents, we're starting small. This is a pilot. We need your help to succeed. And they engaged with us. and. They continue to be the best source of information about how to um, build internet registration and skill building and classes and and you know what to put on the computers um, that kind of thing. So those would be um, my top two. And then I would just put a plug in for leveraging free equipment and software. It really exceeded our expectations. Um, having devices is a huge draw. And we, we did, we had, fortunately, we had technical assistance from a uh, local tech fellow. But um, finding the free resources, um, aggregating those, pulling them together, giving people some context about what they are and can do has been really useful for us. 
Okay, thank you. We, we have some other questions from um, attendees. Um, the first one we, uh, someone asks, um, oh, that's a long question. Sorry, I'm, I'm going back to the results. Okay. Um, someone, someone asked uh, if we have statistics on educational attainment based on having internet versus not having internet. Um, that's an interesting question. We, I did, we did do some research on that. Um, and there's not anything long term, obviously, because the, the internet just hasn't been along, around long enough for these kind of longevity studies. Um, but what's there, interestingly, it, it's mixed. Um, but essentially, the main consensus is that internet access doesn't show as much of a um, as much of a correlation with educational attainment as you would think. Um, and the, sort of the common wisdom there is that it probably has to do with, you know, when kids, when, when school kids have access to all the educational things on the internet, they also have access to all the not so educational things on the internet. Um, so the, the theory there is that, you know, having internet access opens a lot of doors educationally, but it also gives access to games and videos and things like that. So it's, it's sort of mixed, but it's not as much as, as you would have maybe expected. It's not as much as I would have expected to see, the correlation between internet access and educational attainment. Happen, do you have something to add? Um, yeah, you know, I would just share that the first person that registered for our training class was Marilyn Thompson, and she lived almost an hour away by bus. She registered for the classes to earn a computer for her son. He's an AB honor roll student at a high school he was taking college classes, and she said, I feel like my son is doing everything right, and I'm failing him as a mother because I cannot get him a computer. She took the classes, earned the device for her son, and um, they did not have internet at home uh, at the time, but she learned through the, the materials that we deploy online how to check the, the independent school district portal, and she began um, following the Khan Academy videos and ended up about eight months later registering for to earn a, an associate's degree at Austin Community College in healthcare IT. Um, so we we do find lots of um, we do find lots of parents also who feel empowered because they can check that school district portal. They say they know when their kids are there, where they are. They don't have to wait for a teacher to get back. They can check their kids' homework assignments. As one parent said, no more excuses. <laughs> so um, it does empower parents. I don't know if that if that produces an outcome, but they feel good about it. No, that's a really helpful um, perspective to add to that question. Um, the next question that we're going to ask Catherine about is the value of having everyone on in your collaborative with HackUp. Oh gosh, so we were fortunate initially before Connect Home was announced, so in January of 2015, um, that uh, we were fortunate to work with, with everyone on, and uh, there's a, a woman there named Norma Fernandez who worked directly with us, and she helped us, uh, everyone on helped us with engagement materials, um, with a, uh, a, a how-to guide that um, people could use to, when they took their computers home, to set them up. Um, communication tactics. Um, they provided some benchmarks in terms of um, how many, you know, what does it cost to reach people and how many people stay registered. At the time, everyone on was administering a program that provided $10 per month, no contract internet, so they had some data on how, how often how people stay subscribed, et cetera. And I believe, I know that everyone on is a Connect Home partner, and I do believe that they work do work across the nation. So, um, and Rebecca and Mindy, I know that you're connected with everyone on folks, and I can certainly connect uh, anyone who would like to be connected as well. Thanks, Catherine. Um, our next question um, was about how to convince major companies like Comcast to provide free broadband. Um, and so I'm going to touch on that and then see if Catherine has any thoughts to add. So a couple points to raise on that. One is that when you find out that a telecom company, an internet company in your area is contemplating a merger, that is a great uh, time for advocacy and that as a condition of the merger, 
getting approval from the Federal Communications Commission that they provide community services like low-cost broadband. Comcast has done that through their Internet Essentials program. They've recently announced a pilot with, um, I believe it's five public housing agencies, um, two public housing residents uh, where there's a child. Um, as one example, AT&T, as part of its merger with DirecTV, has just announced five or ten dollar a month internet for um, low-income households where there's someone receiving food stamps. Um, so those are just two examples uh, where internet providers are providing a service for low-income households. Uh, but I just wanted to see if Catherine also had some thoughts on that question. Well, um, I guess I, I would just add, um, if you're in a competitive broadband marketplace or even in a, in a duopoly, um, we forget that there, there are often Tier 2 and Tier 3 providers. Um, if, if you, uh, it, so I think for, for major corporations, it's always helpful to reach out to a chief diversity officer, someone who is charged with ensuring that there's equity um, in the provision of services that, um, that the company or products that the company provides. And then, you know, the second part would be, yeah, there are Tier 2 and Tier 3 providers. There are even nonprofit uh, telecom carriers, ETCs, um, around the country. And um, there are some very folks who have become very creative about how to deploy broadband of different kinds. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I would love, love to hear from anybody that's um, working through that and happy to connect you with folks that, that we've met through our initiative. Thanks, Catherine. Um, I want to touch on a couple other questions. One was about working in a rural area and finding partners and how to make it work in rural. And um, we actually don't have much information to share on this point. I will say that as part of Connect Home, there is a couple of rural communities participating and hopefully there'll be some best practices coming out of that. I know for for instance the Choctaw Indian tribe in Oklahoma, what they have been able to do, if memory serves, is work with four different internet service providers to cover the large territory that they're working in. Um, and as Catherine mentioned, these are not this is not your Comcast or your AT and T. These are local internet service providers who um, view it as a market opportunity in addition to wanting to help the community. So um, multiple service providers is one way to try and get at the rural challenge. Um, I will also mention that the U.S. Department of Agriculture in their rural development area has programs to support broadband infrastructure in rural areas um, where they make funding available through loans and grants. So for folks in rural areas, that might be a helpful resource to look into. Um, and then the other question we had was about um, how programs were funded, whether funding was short term or long term. And I will let Mindy touch on Eden Housing and then Catherine can uh, talk about their, their program. Um, well, Eden's program, it, it wasn't um, it was quite different from the program in Austin because it wasn't any, it wasn't a collaboration. It was just they had additional points uh, when trying to get tax credits for for building an affordable housing development. They got extra points for offering free broadband access. Um, so that was that was a good incentive. Um, though they they probably likely would have done that anyway and, and tried to find um, funding through perhaps the foundation grant. Um, but so in that way, they got tax credits in exchange for installing them. On an ongoing basis, the $100, the $190 a month um, fee for the connectivity is funded by uh, rent payments from the residents themselves. Yes, and um, so we have uh, cash funding and gifts and kind funding. And the gifts and kind funding ranges from short term to long term. We prioritize longer term agreements over short term agreements so that we can um, try to develop a, a steady supply of the assets that um, a partner is providing. So for example, um, Austin Community College, uh, they're going to refresh their computer labs over the next three years. 
and so we're planning to um, use their refurbished, use and refurbish their their old devices over the next three years. Um, for example, they have a program, um, and just a little update, Mindy, to something you you mentioned about tech support, where they are uh, providing internships to students in their tech support degree program. And so we are the the first partner um, for that program, and it's it's a three year term. 22 students will be working on site um, per each year to help our residents with tech support. Um, some of our our MOUs are short term. Also, um, we have uh, major funding from Ford Foundation and Open Societies Foundation. That is short term, um, and it's you know very it's been catalytic funding for us. It was very important those larger gifts to helping us um, bring in other local and state stakeholders um, really highlighted how important digital inclusion is. And then we have um, some funding from um, s small corporate funds of, of 5000 or or sometimes $1,000, but that $1,000 can sometimes be an anchor funding or it gives us an opportunity to provide something and to show that we are um, creating an economic impact with our programs and, and it just starts the relationship with that corporate funder. Great. Thanks, Catherine. And then our last question is um, from someone in Silicon Valley who was curious about how to facilitate partnerships between tech companies and housing authorities. So I didn't know if you had some uh, thoughts from your experience, Catherine, that you wanted to share. Well, um, you know, the promise of the internet is that it's the great democratizer. and um, I think the question that I have when I meet a tech company is, what is your public housing strategy? And by asking that question, what is your public housing strategy, um, you can s start to understand what uh, strategies that folks do have for low-income um, communities. So um, the other thing that Silicon Valley knows is that uh, diverse teams make more patents. And Silicon Valley uh, companies are measured, tech companies are measured mostly on how many patents they make. And so um, diversity is a good for innovation. And so the promise of somebody who is living in a different socioeconomic circumstance from maybe the norm of the employees, um, the promise of that person uh, having an idea or an innovation that can help a lot of people in America and can transform um, the, a product or a service that the company offers uh, is is well understood in, by Silicon Valley. Um, and I think the last the last piece of that is we have as a as a country we have a need to um, diversify our tech pipeline, and I mean diversify in every in every sense. So Silicon Valley companies are eagerly looking to build the talent pipeline. So starting in ninth grade, tenth grade, eleventh grade, they're willing to um, find sources of tech talent in diverse communities. So those are the, the three things, you know, starting with what's your public housing strategy? And then we use um, our relationship with public housing to, to provide equity to be more innovative, to ensure that we have a diverse tech pipeline. Um, those are some questions that I think if you, if you start with can help um, tighten the relationship between Silicon Valley companies and, and a public housing authority. And again, we would, Sylvia Blanco, our EVP, and I would be really um, happy to share what we've learned in more detail uh, to anyone that, with anyone who needs, who needs support. Thank you so much, Catherine. That information is so helpful. And um, as you can see from the slide that's still available um, is Catherine's contact information. So please do reach out um, if you want more detailed information from Hacka's experience. Um, with that, I think we're going to close out the webinar. I want to thank Catherine especially for joining us today and to thank the Housing Authority of the City of Austin and Eden Housing for their work um, with us on the case studies. We really appreciate that. 
and to thank all of you for participating and your great questions, and to thank Capital One again for its financial support of NHC's webinar series. With the help of Capital One, NHC holds webinars regularly on a variety of housing policy and research topics. So for more details on those webinars and looking and including resources from past webinars, you can click the Capital One webinars button on our homepage at nhc.org. So thank you again so much to everyone for attending. For just to remind you, we will send out a follow-up email with all the resources from the webinar, including the recording. And we hope you have a lovely afternoon.